So we have the following interpretations of Euler's number. Euler's number was the constant obtained by compounding at a rate of 1 over n, compounding n times, and then letting n go to infinity. Via calculus, we could express it as the constant for which the associated exponential function satisfies d on dx of the exponential e to the x is exactly itself again. And in terms of integrals, then it's the solution t of the equation, the integral from one to t of one over x dx is equal to one. A number is said to be transcendental if it is not algebraic. In other words, if alpha is a transcendental number, then alpha is not the root of any polynomial with rational coefficients. Both pi and Euler's number are transcendental. It's not possible to find a polynomial with rational coefficients such that f of pi is zero or f of e is zero. No such polynomial exists. So given that both pi and Euler's number are transcendental and pi has such an elementary description, we want to know whether Euler's number admits a geometric description in a similar manner. The ancient Greeks had a candidate for what makes a number geometric, numbers that we now refer to as constructibles. Unfortunately, pi is not a constructible number, so constructible numbers are not really the geometric interpretation of numbers that we're looking for. Remember, we're asking whether e is geometric in the sense that pi is geometric. So we may need to ask a more general question. Namely, what is geometry? What is the geometric interpretation that we're looking for? I don't claim to know the answer of what geometry is, but I feel that we all have some intuitions. When we think about geometry, we think of words like lengths, we think of volume, we think of shape, and we think of angle. But how can these ideas be formalized into a class of numbers? And is this question even meaningful? If we look at surfaces, for example, if we look at the sphere, or we look at the torus, given by this donut shape here, the key difference in their geometry is the number of holes that they have. The sphere has no holes at all, while the torus has exactly one hole. So to understand what would make a number geometric, let's attempt to understand how we could measure the number of holes on a surface. One way in which we can study the geometry of a space is by looking at loops on that space. If we consider the loops on the torus given here, we see that the loops do not get caught on any part of the geometry. They are free to contract and expand as much as they like albeit they're confined to the surface. But if we consider the loops in this direction, however, the loops get caught around the central hole. We can't contract it or expand it indefinitely. It's confined by this hole. This is not the only hole in which a loop can get caught. And I'd like you to tell me in the comments section down below if you can find the other hole on the torus which confines the loop and prevents loops from being contracted. So what we see here is that loops getting caught tells us about the presence of holes in the geometry. And so in particular, we can use loops to understand a geometric object. So looking at loops on a surface can give us information about its geometry. But what do loops have to do with numbers? This isn't at all clear. So let's try something else. So suppose that we have a smooth function from the reals to the reals, such that at every point, its derivative is equal to zero. What can we say about f? Well, if we sketch a parabola, just to remind ourselves of what the derivative is, if the function slopes down, it has negative derivative. If the derivative is zero, it's flat there. And if the derivative is positive, the function slopes up. So if the derivative is zero everywhere, the function doesn't curl up or curl down. It therefore has to be constant. This time, suppose we have a smooth function, not on the real line, but on the punctured real line. We're gonna remove the origin from the real line such that the derivative is again equal to zero at every point. And what can we say about f this time? Well, nothing changes for f. Right? At no point does f curl up or bend down. So f should again be constant. 
this turns out not to be the case. Consider the function on the punctured real line into R given by the following formula. For x greater than 0, f assumes the value 1, but for x less than 0, it assumes the value minus 1. This function is smooth everywhere and has derivative equal to 0 at all points of its domain. But the function is not constant. Removing the origin from the real line has violated the implication that f prime of x equal to 0 at all points implies f is constant. Notice that if we punctured the real line twice, say we considered the function on the real line removed minus 1 and 0, and assumed that the derivative was again equal to 0 everywhere, then a similar example, such as taking the function described by the formula equal to 1 when x is positive, 0 when x is between minus 1 and 0, and minus 1 when x is less than minus 1, then again this function is locally constant, meaning that its derivative is equal to 0 at all points of its domain. But the function can take three distinct values. So what we see here is that if we have a function on R whose derivative is everywhere 0, then it takes only one value, it's constant. So if we have a function whose derivative is equal to 0 everywhere on the real line except the origin, then that can take two values. And if we look at a function whose derivative is everywhere 0 on the real line except minus 1 and 0, the real line except two points, then that can take three values. Note that many of us have actually seen this idea before. So recall that in vector calculus we learnt that a vector field is said to be conservative if it's given by the grad of some potential f. So here f is just some smooth function on R2. And so in other words, a vector field is conservative if its x component or its i component is given by the partial derivative of f in the x direction and its j component is given by the partial derivative of f in the y direction. So for example, if we look at the vector field f of xy is given by 2xy plus y squared in the i direction, and x squared plus 2xy in the j direction, then this is conservative since we can take the potential to be f of xy is equal to x squared y plus y squared x. Let's remind ourselves that we can check whether a vector field is conservative by computing its curl. So recall that the curl of a vector field is given by the cross product of the grad vector, where grad is given by the partial derivatives in the x and y direction, and zero in the z direction, since I want to keep everything on R2. F, we'll assume, is given by u of xy in the i direction, and v of xy in the j direction. Again, zero in the z or k direction. So the curl being given by the cross product of the grad and the vector field is given by the determinant of the associated matrix that we see here. So the determinant of this 3 by 3 matrix is given by the alternating sum of the determinants of the minors. And further simplification tells us that we end up with 0 in the i and j direction. But in the j direction we have the x partial derivative of v minus the y partial derivative of u. If f is conservative, then the i component of f is given by the x derivative of some smooth function f and the j direction is given by the partial derivative of some smooth function f in the y. So if we insert this, in other words, u is equal to partial f over partial x, and v is equal to partial f over partial y, what we find is that the curl in the kth direction is given by the second derivative of f with respect to xy minus the second derivative of f with respect to yx. But now since f is smooth, the partial derivatives commute, and the resulting vector is zero. This verifies the fact that we all know, which is that conservative vector fields are irrotational. In other words, if f is a vector field given by the grad of some potential, then its curl necessarily vanishes. But remember that for the reverse implication to be true, we need to assume an additional technical assumption. This technical assumption is what's called simply connectedness, and it means exactly that the space has no holes in it. So this first example here of this orange region is an example of a simply connected domain in R2, and this green region on the right-hand side is an example 
of a domain in R2 which is not simply connected. So we can determine if there are holes in the space by checking the failure of irrotational vector fields being conservative. We know that conservative vector fields are always irrotational. If f is the grad of some potential, then its curl has to be zero. But if we look at the vector fields for which the curl is equal to zero, then they're not necessarily conservative, but an irrotational vector field on a space with no holes, that is conservative. So in other words, if an irrotational vector field is not conservative, if we're on a space on which an irrotational vector field is not given by the grad of some potential, that tells us that the space that we are on, the space that we're defining these vector fields on, has holes in it. In other words, we can measure the geometry of a space by looking at the failure of irrotational vector fields to be conservative.